Hello, welcome back uh, for another class uh, on the in the you know speech signal processing course. Uh, so, uh, just to remind you about what we have been doing, uh, uh, so that you know a revision sort of happens. Uh, I first talked about uh, what is the reason. I mean, the importance of speech, right? So, speech is basically a means for communication, right? So that that is the fundamental idea, right? Why do we speak? We want to communicate something. So. That is the whole idea of uh, you know uh, uh, you know going into speech processing because we want uh, then to be able to speak to machines and machines speaking back to us and so on and so on right and speech also carries a lot of other information right about the speaker the gender and so on so we are looking at automated ways of extracting these information and uh, making use of it uh, for various reasons right uh, so that is the basic idea of this whole course. And so, once you talk about speech, there is the speaker and the listener, right? So, uh, the speaker formulates a message, speaks it uh, using words that he thinks is appropriate. The brain actually is doing all this work and in a language that, uh, you know, you deem fit for that particular situation, right? But also, the other aspect of speech is important, that is the listener aspect, right? So, you communicate so that you pass information to somebody else, right? So, the communication needs the other end, the receiver. And so, there is a question of the perceptual aspects of speech, right? How does the hear, uh, or how does the ear hear things, right? And how does it process? How does the brain process and so on? So, we know that there is a eardrum that vibrates and then there is a basilar membrane that I talked about that basically does some kind of a frequency analysis and uh, you know that is the way uh, these uh, you know basilar membranes actually there are uh, you know nerve endings there right nerve fibers and these get fired because of the basilar membrane depending on the different frequencies that the ear is you know uh, the eardrum is sensing okay. And then we talked about uh, the speech production process itself that the lungs uh, you know drive the air and uh, there is the opening and closing of the glottis and then the mouth shapes it for different sounds. So, we talked about phonemes which are the basic units of spoken language, okay. So, these are the basic acoustic units of spoken language, right. So, so this is analogous to, um, the this is analogous to you know the alphabets in the written language. So, in English for written language you have uh, uh, you know A to Z if you are only talking about small case letters or in Hindi you know we have uh, you know the written is uh, all of these guys. So, the uh, the R, uh, the E and the E and uh, you know K, K, Y, R, L, sort of thing, right. So, uh, th these are essentially uh, the written uh, written alphabets, right. So, and spoken alphabets even for English uh, are, uh, there are about 44 uh, for spoken English, uh, you know, we have uh, roughly about 44 different phonemes, right, 44 phonemes. Uh, Hindi also uh, roughly we have 44. Uh, some sometimes we talk also about 52 phonemes, 52 different sounds, which we concatenate to form words, right? Or spoken words, concatenate to form spoken words, right? So that is another aspect of speech processing that uh, you you know you must be encountering for the first time, and the way we characterize a particular sound ah uh, or e is dependent on whether it is voiced or unvoiced, the opening and closing of the glottis and the particular shape of the mouth. So, each one of them have a particular uh, condition in which the mouth, the tongue, the lips, uh, jaw, etc. have to be, which are called the articulators and that is how we produce a particular uh, phoneme, okay. So, that, that is something we talked about and then the hearing aspects came. So, we talked about the hearing aspects and there we said that what you sense is different from the physical frequency. So, frequency versus perceived frequency or the mel, okay. So, physical versus the perceived or psychoacoustic. And we, we talk about the relationship between F mel 
uh, as something like 1125. So, some empirical results uh, have been obtained which fit a curve. So, we have asked a lot of people to measure the physical, I mean, close their eyes and say, can you change it to the next, you know, higher uh, uh, octave or next higher, you know, uh, uh, pitch that you are sensing. And uh, normally, the physical frequency is much higher than the actual perceived frequency, okay. And so, this is uh, one aspect. Then there is intensity which is the actual amplitude versus, uh, uh, you know, the loudness. So, loudness is again a perceived quantity. I am not going into, uh, you know, there are curves. So, we have empirical curves that measure. So, we do not sense the same loudness at different frequencies. Some frequencies for the same amplitude, right, intensity, it will sound louder to the ear and for some frequencies it will sound softer, okay. So, there is a frequency dependence on the loudness itself, okay. So, we are not talking about all of these, I mean we talked about it. So, I am just, uh, I am not, uh, you know, this, you know, I briefly only tell, but this is a very important idea, okay. Because the ear does everything on the male, male scale and we borrow that in all of our processing, signal processing. Then I talked about the idea of masking, right. Uh, if there is a strong tone, then we we normally, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, do not sense the neighboring frequencies and that is the principle on which the mp3 players work, okay. Then I talked about, uh, you know, processing the speech signal. So, there was why are we doing speech, uh, why is speech important, then we talked about how speech is produced and then how is it is listened to by the listener, right, how is it perceived by the listener. Now, we are going to slowly move towards the aspect of the, you know, the technology itself. How are we going, to, what are we going to do with the signal? What, uh, what things, what useful things can we achieve and so on. So, slowly we are now moving into the, so there is a science aspect. What is it happening? Why is it happening? I mean, do we understand and so on. Now, we are saying, okay, now that I know that speed signal is some, uh, you know, compression and rarefaction that is happening, right, and I pick up the signal and measure it, you know, uh, using a microphone or something and store it, can I do something useful with it? So, that is where we are starting now, right. So, speech processing we are starting, the signal is received, can I do something with, with the signal, right. So, that is where last class we talked about the features or something that is useful and one of the popular ones are called the Mel filter bank, right. And also uh, derived from that is a Mel frequency Kepstrel coefficient, okay. And this basically comes from the idea that, you know, we have an excitation. So, this is the excitation kind of thing, which is an input to speech uh, to the mouth. So, the mouth acts like uh, a filter, right. So, a filter and it has its own frequency response, resonant frequencies. These are the uh, resonant frequencies for e each sound it is going to be different and the term we use is called formants, okay. And out comes the speed signal whose Fourier transform is going to be multiplication of the excitation E of omega with V of omega. So, the S of omega will look like this. So, there will be this, uh, you know, uh, the envelope and the E of omega and V of omega multiplied, right. So, this is the source filter model that we talk about and often our interest is more in removing the or looking at the, the, the vocal tract aspects, the V of omega here, the vocal tract aspects of uh, the signal I am interested in many, uh, uh, for many applications. And so, we said that one way to separate, so this is a multiplication of uh, V of omega with E of omega. And uh, we know from signal processing that if there is a slowly varying signal and a rapidly varying signal that are added together, then if I low pass filter that by some kind of an averaging, then I retain the low uh, slowly varying part and the rapidly varying part is filtered out, okay. And therefore, you get only the 
after the averaging operation you will get only the slowly varying part and that is the principle on which all of these operate. So basically the steps that are there and this is where we have talked about last class, these are the essential steps that we do. We take the speed signal, there is a pre-emphasis, I am not, that is something to do with the spectral slope, uh, you know, uh, we want to raise it back to the normal thing and uh, then there is the windowing effect, right, uh, uh, which is because we want to do short time analysis and then we go into the Fourier domain and uh, the fast Fourier transform algorithm is the uh, algorithm we use to go into the Fourier domain. Now comes the important part, we know that the year operates more in the perceived domain, the Bell domain rather than the physical frequencies. So even in our signal processing, we want to exploit because year, if year is doing, there must be something, I mean, year is one of the best recognizers, right? So uh, it processes speed signal best, right? We humans are the best at doing it. So why not use that idea here? And that is what we do. And normally uh, we apply a lock to reduce the dynamic range. And this is where we stop in today's world. Most of our applications will stop here because we don't worry about the correlations between these features. And so for deep learning, machine learning kind of things, I mean deep learning kind of uh, methods, we stop here. But when you're doing more of the conventional statistical methods, especially when you're using a mixture of Gaussians, we have an additional step called the DCT or the discrete cosine transform which is basically the purpose of which is to just make these uh, uh, features more decorrelated, okay. So I will just summarize what, uh, uh, what we do. So given a speed signal, okay, uh, first of all, and I am repeating it multiple times, but I think it is well worth the effort, right. So this is always 25 milliseconds. Historically, we have found out that this works best. This is 25 milliseconds. So we, we shift, we take windows of 25 milliseconds, right, sorry. Then and the these are spaced 10 milliseconds. So each frame starts from, this is sometimes also uh, called frames. So the idea of frames is something that comes in, okay. So uh, you know these are uh, each uh, blocks of signal and the reason why you do short time signal processing, we know that the frequency of the speed signal keeps changing and what is the basic idea? First thing is we want to do Fourier analysis. So in the local region around this, the, this region in time, we think that the frequency content does not change much, okay. It is very only 25 milliseconds, so we think, you know, mouth cannot change so fast, so we believe it is almost stationary, nothing much changes this, in this interval of 25 milliseconds or in this interval of 25 milliseconds, right. So we assume that nothing changes and so we do a Fourier analysis and uh, uh, there is a pre-emphasis step, do not worry about it. So, so if I take this particular step that I am talking about, right, so I have the original signal. So I am doing like this, right? So, and I've taken this particular speed signal, 25 milliseconds. Then what do I do? I do a Fourier transform of this. So uh, an algorithm, so this is DFT, but uh, you know, on computers, we want to implement it using a fast Fourier transform algorithm, right? That automatically gets, gets me into the frequency domain, right? And so in the frequency domain, it will be something like the envelope will be there and all these uh, these guys will be there, right? And therefore, what do I do now next? I do some kind of a averaging. So in this case, we do triangular averaging, okay, okay. So I will just come to why uh, we should do. So the triangular averaging. So what we want to do is we want to operate in Mel scale. And therefore, in the Mel scale, in the Mel scale, we want, you know, the averaging to be uniform. So this is uniformly spaced and uniformly, uniformly spaced filter. And uniform bandwidth. Okay. But what happens is we normally prefer to do everything in the physical frequency domain, F hertz. 
right and therefore it will become non uniformly spaced and non uniform bandwidth actually as the uh, frequency increases the bandwidth will increase and uh, the spacing between the frequent uh, the filters also will change okay and this is because of the relationship between bell and uh, physical frequency and then so now we get the output we apply a log here log mel filter bank so i i average with this guy and i get one number here i average uh, with this guy right with this filter so here and uh, then if you look at this guy's average something will come here so th these are the outputs so normally for wideband speech we use 80 filters okay wideband means the total speech as i'm speaking which is picked up by the microphone narrow band means when i'm passing it through a telephone channel for those we use 40 filters okay so these will be 40 numbers will come 40 or 80 values will come okay depending on whether we are talking about narrow band or wide band so i will get a 40 uh, or an 80 dimensional feature vector okay this can be mel these are log mel filter bank features okay so this is the basic idea this is for the the blue uh, sorry i should put this as blue for the blue window of 25 milliseconds, I get this. Next, I'm going to move by 10 milliseconds and again look at a 25 millisecond window. Therefore, I'll repeat that and I'll get another 80 cross dimensional vector, which will correspond to the, the green part of the signal. Then I come to the red part of the window. So I will get the red part coming here, which is also 80 dimensional. Then I come to the black part, which is also 80 dimensional. So if I start, so each one are spaced 10 milliseconds. So this corresponds, let's say the zero millisecond, this will correspond to the 10 millisecond. This will correspond to the 20 millisecond. This will correspond to the 30 millisecond. So if I keep moving from where I'm starting and then I'm moving by 10, 10, 10 milliseconds. So I basically will have 100 such frames or vectors per second right because every 10 milliseconds i am having so one second is thousand milliseconds so you will get 100 such frames okay so this is what we call as the sequence of mel filter bank features so it is time order right sequence of mel filter bank features okay so this is essentially what we are trying to do so if you can think of this as a matrix itself, so in this direction we are going in time, this is ac actually capturing the frequency, right? So remember this, this 80, these numbers that were, is now, these are the numbers that 80 numbers I was getting, that I am plotting it as one column, right? Uh, belonging to 10 millisecond. So therefore, there will be like this, uh, the blue one comes, right? So the blue one comes, the green one comes that's the next column the red one comes oh, sorry the red one comes the next column the black one comes the next column so along time and this is along frequency all right and the values are actually measured right so that's the third dimension that you have right so we store this basically in, in on computers and do for further signal processing or some application that you want to build using these features. So we'll come to it when you talk about automatic speech recognition, speech synthesis, speaker verification, emotion recognition, hundreds of things you can do with these things, okay? So that is the basic idea of speech signal processing, okay? 